Okay, yeah, so the paper that I wrote uh, for the Lemon Center really focuses on the public, dis what I'm calling the public discourse of Brazilian education uh, in the midst of COVID-19. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by discourse um, in a couple of minutes. So just to start off with a few numbers, um, with more than 9 million known cases of COVID-19 and a death toll that's surpassing 225,000, Brazil is the country with the second highest rate of COVID infections and deaths in the world. The pandemic's waves have migrated from Brazil's rich to its poor, from its beachside resorts to its interior, urban peripheries and favelas, where it now poses a particularly ominous threat for the disadvantaged people who live there. Especially since the Supreme Court shut its doors in mid-March, life in Brazil has really transformed dramatically, uh, especially for young people who can no longer attend school and who have to stay confined at home. With more than 180,000 schools closed and around 47 million students at home without face-to-face -face classes, the landscape of education in Brazil is rapidly transforming and has forced students, teachers, and parents to become more dependent than perhaps they ever thought they would be on remote technologies for distributing and accessing educational content. So while it's true that many students have been able to tune in to their classes from home, for many more remote connection is either precarious or non-existent. Yet social isolation measures have nonetheless brought a shift in Brazilian, brought about a shift in Brazilian education toward education at a distance, what I will repeatedly refer to as EAD. Um, these practices and platforms of remote education which highlight the problems of access and inequality that plague Brazil's education system and call into question what school can and should look like. So I wanted to figure out how this question is being answered in a time where Brazilian education is experiencing an unprecedented crisis. As a communication scholar, this meant initially examining the communication sphere around education over the past few years, and then since the start of COVID-19, to understand the kinds of issues that were prioritized in education then, and how these issues have changed in lieu of the pandemic. So in recent years, the communication sphere around Brazilian education has been largely dominated by several key questions, including the questions that I've put up here on the screen. These are questions of ownership, which revolve around concerns regarding the privatization of schools and the allocation of public resources for private and semi-private initiatives. Questions of external influence, which refers to the kind of corporatization of school programming. Questions of internal influence related to school curriculums and the debates around the inclusion of particular subjects or authors on school syllabi such as the uh, obligation to teach indigenous history in elementary school classes, middle school classes. And then also questions about inequality and access to educational resources. So what I found in looking at the communication landscape around education since the start of COVID is that these questions have shifted somewhat. Some of them have diminished in their importance and some of them have really, really grown. I'll dive into the specifics of this in a moment. Just want to say a couple things really quick about my method, um, because from what I understand, it's a method that's not necessarily dominant in education research, though perhaps some of you are, are familiar with it. So um, I wanted to characterize and to analyze the ongoing debates about Brazilian education in the midst of COVID. And to do so, I draw upon a qualitative and interpretive method of analyzing texts that's broadly referred to as discourse analysis or critical discourse analysis. It's essentially a form of text analysis that takes into account first the purposes and effects of language, how beliefs and values are communicated, and how these beliefs get generated in ways that either reflect or connect to the broader social and political context in which they're espoused. So there are many traditions of discourse analysis, but mine is inspired by the Foucauldian tradition, um, which 
relates to Michel Foucault, the philosopher and others. And it understands discourse to encompass not only text, but also spoken communication, social norms and practices that shape communication. And importantly for my, for my paper, and as you'll see in this report, uh, it also purports to examine the political dimension of communication where texts, uh, speeches, and other com communication practices are informed by and shape relations of power. So in doing my discourse analysis, um, I constructed my analysis by relying on a compilation of cultural and political texts from 2020. Um, any text that discusses or takes a position regarding ongoing issues in Brazilian education. For me, I thought of that text as constituting the public discourse that relates to it. So just for one example, one area that I really focused on because it kept popping up in the media and social media on um, the websites of different political parties uh, concerns education at a distance or mm -hmm. EAD. Um, and in analyzing this, the significance of this discussion and others, I pay attention to the way that language is used to formulate these debates and how the debates are structured in ways that point, point to broader political tendencies regarding the use of technology in Brazilian education. So my main argument, I just put it up on the screen for you guys, is that critical Melinda, issues- Melinda, um, can I interrupt you just for a second? Sure, of course. I mean, yeah, I mean, one of the issues that always comes up in, in social science research and, and it, it comes up in yours too is sampling. I mean, that you you sort of, as, as you're talking about methodology, it would really be helpful, I think, for us if you talked about what, what, what your sampling strategy looks like. You've, you've identified your sources, but how do you identify which ones are worth paying attention to, how much weight to assign to different sources, which ones are just marginal to the whole conversation? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, because there's so much discourse that you have to find some way to filter through it. Uh, one of the main, one of the main ways that I that I filter um, like different articles and decide which ones I'm going to choose has a lot to do with the amount of traction that they've received. Uh, in the media, how many people have commented on them, how many people have seen them. So looking at social media, for example, is a really is something that's very useful for me in sampling because you can see very directly how many people like a certain page that relates to a certain political party or something like that, and then know that that organization or that party has quite a lot of visibility. And that would be something that I would want to include in my sample. Um, yeah, so, so typically I cross reference between um, traditional media and social media to figure out what, how large and what kind of audience um, can be attributed to these different sources. And then I'll pick them from there. Does that help a little bit? It helps, yeah, I think we'll, we'll come back to it, but, but yeah, let's, let's, let's go ahead. Okay. Okay. Come back to it. Yeah. Any questions you guys have, you can feel free to just ask whenever. Um, so my main argument that I'm advancing in this paper is that critical issues in Brazilian education are discussed in ways that end up polarizing the debate around education into long-standing ideological camps. So they render the, the public discourse around Brazilian education in COVID ends up rendering questions that are common to most students, parents, and teachers as ideological positions. Uh, the primary terrain for the debate also on, on over how best to respond to COVID is largely constructed around the question of online distance learning or, EA, or what I keep referring to as EAD, which I know has a very specific definition but I'm sort of referring to all um, predominantly online distance learning uh, plat practices and platforms as EAD in this presentation, just so I don't have to keep saying online distance learning over and over. Um, but in any case, there's uh, this discourse around EAD or online distance learning reflects longstanding conflicts between different political parties and different political positions. This debate, moreover, is waged at the expense of teachers and parents, 
whose concerns and questions about remote learning are largely ignored or set aside. So my report essentially delineates the threads that constitute the communication landscape of Brazilian education in three parts. The first part uh, addresses the broader ideological discussions regarding distance education in the pandemic and the way that these discussions have been taken up by different political interests. The second uh, speaks to pandemic related issues that are being raised by teachers and parents and interrogates the place of these actors in the broader public uh, and political discourse. And the third provides a quick synthesis of the public discourse on Brazilian education during COVID and what it indicates for the future of teaching and learning in pandemic times. Like I said, most of the public discourse around Brazilian education in COVID revolves around the question of remote learning or education at a distance. There are three main sub discourses when people talk about education at a distance that I wanna focus on in this presentation. The first is access and inequality. So this is the question of how EAD reinforces or potentially disrupts trends towards inequality in education. The second is privatization um, a long-standing concern that's existed before the pandemic, obviously, but something that education at a distance has really brought to the fore um, and has caused a lot of discussion about what privatizing education means, means for it and means for, for students in particular. And the third area that I like to discuss, it relates to surveillance capitalism. So this is a question of whether EAD contributes to data extraction practices and potentially, potentially problematic business models or whether it does not. Just a few quick stats that I'm gonna run through that are relevant to this question of education, education at a distance, access and equality. Uh, in Brazil, you probably are familiar with this so we can just go through it really quickly. But in Brazil, 95.3% of children aged seven to four are in school and nearly 40% of these students are part of the poorest classes in the country. 55 million Brazilians live below the poverty line. That's a quarter of the entire population. And coronavirus, which has moved many face-to-face -face activities into the digital sphere, has amplified these broader issues of inequality um, and brought them into focus in education. This is bolstered by data that shows that every one in four Brazilians has no access to the internet. Of all Brazilians, 58% don't have access to computers and 43% of rural areas don't even have the infrastructure for remote signals. And for many more uh, who do have access to the internet and to you know, have digital connections, their connections are precarious. They have limited data and limited ability to stream video content or participate in other typical EAD activities. Just one example um, that I found, and I can pass you guys my sources for all of these statistics later. I just didn't put them in the PowerPoint because I didn't want to take up too much space. Um, but according to professors from the city network of Sapopamba in the state of Sao Paulo, for every 30 students now enrolled in digital platforms, on average, only five are able to participate in scholarly activities. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the kind of problem that we're dealing with when we talk about remote education or digital remote education access and equality in Brazil. Now, these questions are also, this. The question of access and inequality is particularly marked in the differences between public and private schools. The public sector, or the private sector, sorry, has long had access to remote learning technologies through the companies that it's formed partnerships with, companies and organizations. Uh, 65, a little bit more than 65% of respondents from the private sector in a Peninsula Institute study said that they provide distance support for students whereas public schools are just not equipped with as many of these resources, just 
from the um, from municipal networks and 36.2 percent from the state from the state network. I think this data is from Sao Paulo uh, report providing remote support for students. Let's see. Let's skip back. Okay, now getting back to the discourses, uh, the questions of access and inequality are super prevalent across the landscape of political communication in Brazil. Different political parties and alliances have mobilized to propose solutions to these problems. For the Bolsonaro governments and others, which I'll discuss, the solution to access problems and inequality problems is precisely the widespread replacement of face-to-face -face classes with digital learning. For example, the National Education Council, Brazil's National Education Council, officially declared digital learning its best solution for inequality and dropout um, just last year and recommended that digital activities be broadly implemented and offered from early childhood onward. The government's enthusiasm for education at a distance does somewhat ignore uh, these problems of internet access that that per are pervasive in the country's less connected peripheral regions. But nonetheless, the pr previous Minister of Education, Abraham Weintraub, uh, recommended that face-to-face -face classes give way, increasingly give way to online educational resources. A number of uh, political organizations have also echoed this approach to digital education. The conservative liberal socialist party advocates for financing of EAD services in partnership with uh, the private sector and advocates for EAD as an important solution uh, for as an important solution for education during the pandemic, but not necessarily because of inclusion um, or access. Rather, where the, rather the the this party um, understands EAD as something that helps to integrate individuals back within the marketplace and is useful for streamlining educational processes and for reducing the interference of politicians and bureaucrats. So it makes digital technology, education at a, at a distance, makes individuals the protagonists of their history. This is important. It's a theme that I'll come back to a couple times. Uh, for Podemos and other conservative parties, solutions to education equality, inequality during the pandemic are also technological. The incorporation of tablets, uh, inclusion of computers in every classroom, these kinds of solutions are, are what these parties and a number of large educational institutes opt for when talking about access and inequality. Just one more example before we get to the the counter argument here is that the um, Millennium Institute, which is an educational related think tank, says that inequalities within the public school system are best addressed by modeling the tech savvy of the private schools. So the institution opts for uh, the inclusion of high speed internet access and the implementation of EAD platforms as necessary bases for education equality and places the role of individuals as paramount, particularly for teachers who the Institute urges to adjust to a new normal and to prepare themselves for a new way of teaching. So the role of individuals is really important here for um, those who advocate on behalf of education at a distance as a solution to inequality. But while some actors advocate for digital solutions, others are really, really skeptical and critical their foremost concerns of education at a distance are precisely these issues of access and equality. The, the EAD or education at a distance has been referred to as exclusion at a distance by um, PISOL, which is a political party. Uh, their argument is essentially that inequality is amplified by the implementation of EAD tools and by the government's uh, acceptance of their of face-to-face uh, -face classes replacement by them. They think that an overly optimistic stance toward digital uh, solutions is essentially the same as confusing online EAD with the use of technology in the classroom, the latter of which is really necessary, they say. So these EAD skeptics also think of the government and the political parties' support of 
EAD as a pretext for advancing other ideological and financial interests. Uh, online EAD is thought of as a strategy for, pub for funneling public resources into the private distance education market and is said to sort of um, uh, be indicative of the ongoing privatization of basic education via distance education. So one, one example, a strong example <clears throat> of this kind of discourse skeptical or critical discourse of technology has been advanced by the Workers' Party or PT, uh, which have written a number of reports about, uh, about EAD, have written a number of reports about uh, education during the pandemic. And what they say and what others like them, like the PESOL and other leftist oriented political parties and organizations say is that Solutions to education inequality during the pandemic can't be individually oriented. They have to account for structural conditions. So they opt for strengthening unions, strengthening federations, maintaining human rights. Uh, they opt for the provision of more resources to public schools for, for federal food programs and so on and so forth. So we have a, a um, we have an argument here essentially between a discourse of individualism on the one hand where individuals are the protagonists of their history and technological savvy is a solution for wider systemic problems. And then a structural understanding of the issues at stake on the other hand, which look towards system-wide solutions and, and the mitigating of, of certain structural uh, conditions as, as the way out of inequality and access problems. That's a pretty a basic argument and counter argument at stake here. I just wanna talk for a moment about um, NM, the gateway test that Brazilian students take before entering the university system, because I think it's really illustrative for showing the ways in which online EAD, access and inequality have become really tenuous ideological issues during the pandemic. So just a little bit of background. In the first months of the pandemic, there was a, a huge wave of media attention related to this standardized national exam. Um, in lieu of the virus, mi millions of Brazilians mobilized to convince government leaders to push back the 2020 NM registration deadline. But the government was very resistant to making this decision, especially politicians who mark the right and extreme right, like Flavio Bolsonaro and Abraham Weintraub. Uh, so in an effort to broaden appeal for its push to maintain the original NM deadline, the Brazilian Ministry of Education launched a video campaign on Twitter that got um, quite a lot of traction. And it featured young Brazilians in their home advocating for the maintenance of the original NM date. And I'd like to, if I may, just show a little bit of this video so you guys can sort of see what I'm talking about um, when we talk about these discourses and the arguments that people are, are advocating for. Can I do this? It's in Portuguese. I hope that's okay. It's very short, but I'll give you a little bit of context afterwards or everyone should be able to understand what's going on. E se uma geração de novos profissionais fosse perdida? Médicos, enfermeiros, engenheiros, professores. Seria o melhor para o nosso país? A vida não pode parar. Precisa ir à luta, se reinventar, superar. Dias melhores virão. E por isso eu quero fazer o Enem este ano. Pra entrar em uma universidade. Estude. De qualquer lugar, de diferentes formas. Com os livros, internet. Com a ajuda à distância dos professores. Faça já sua inscrição no Enem. De 11 a 22 de maio. Pelo site enem.inep.gov.br Além da prova em papel, este ano também terá o Enem digital. Feito por computador em locais indicados pelo Enem. As provas serão no final do ano. Até lá, estude. Seu futuro já está aí. Ministério da Educação. Governo Federal. Pátria Amada Brasil.
Okay. So that's the video. The government's pro NM campaign is very much as you as you heard focused on individual effort as the key to positive educational outcomes. It's emphasizing a discourse that's very central to the debates around EAD, which is individualism, um, that the valuing of individual effort um, instead of recognizing and accounting for structural disparities. So instead of asking how an M can be reworked in a time of crisis to bridge the digital divide, this video and the discourses that, that surround it um, in government publications and so on and so forth, ask individuals to reinvent themselves, to find a way to study, to find a way to connect with their teachers, rather than asking why aren't students connecting with their teachers or what is preventing students from quote unquote reinventing themselves. This, so this push to maintain an M through kind of mobilization of, of individual effort and people pulling themselves up by their bootstraps aligns very much with the broader objective that the government had of maintaining the school calendar or of, of returning as quickly as possible to it. Of course, following this video's release, critics immediately responded. Uh, their main complaints are up on the screen. Uh, first, Brazilian reality does not look like the reality of people in this video, uh, critics said. Um, Brazilians typically don't have their own home office as most of the people in this video seemed to. Some even lack tables on which to study. Uh, of course, we know that high-speed internet to connect with teachers and connect with these resources that these kids are talking about in the video is precarious and difficult for a lot of Brazilians. Uh, in fact, I, I read a statistic uh, the other day that 40% of Brazilian students claim not to even have adequate space for studying at home. So different, drastically different realities, these critics were saying. Second, they argued that refusing to push the NM deadline would reinforce deep-seated inequality. So with much of the school year already gone and with so many Brazilian kids without access to digital learning platforms, maintaining the original deadline would place many at a disadvantage in relation to their more privileged classmates. They also argued that this video, which is very much focused on individual effort in the present and these kids' individual futures, doesn't, it underestimates the broader history of NM as a qualification tool that's used for those who can't pay for private tutoring. And it underestimates the social impact that COVID has had on this population. So in response to this video, there was an online campaign, Sing Aula Sing NM, that was launched to highlight this issue of inequality and proposed postponing the test until after the end of the 2021 school year. The Brazilian left very quickly aligned with this campaign and the issues that this campaign, which was actually a compilation of a couple thousand small campaigns, uh, the issues that they raised ultimately forced the Brazilian government to call for a later registration date. So they, they, they got what they wanted, but the test integration into the digital sphere is imminent since the government has taken COVID-19 as an opportunity to begin moving NM to a completely online format and expects the digital format to replace the paper version by 2026. Along with NM, school abandonment is another concern that animates the broader political debates around education at a distance and its capacity to resolve issues of access and inequality. A common is this is a common concern across the political spectrum. Since Brazil's rate of school dropouts or school abandonment, when I wrote this paper, was 10% and climbing. So given this, much of the discourse in education has shifted its key question from are students learning to will they stay? This question is particularly salient in the context of EAD, where the biggest challenge lies in developing meaningful connections between technologies, schools, and students. Yet, 
rather than being a point of common ground, abandonment or dropout has also been a point of contention among these different political positions and showcases how public actors are treating Brazilian education during the pandemic. So for some, abandonment is seen as a potentially drastic loss of economic potential. It's seen as being predominantly caused by a lack of connection between individuals and schools. And for folks who take up this perspective, the solution to school abandonment is implementing more technologies that promise to increase individual connection and increase motivation. For others, EAD skeptics, uh, school dropout is not an indicator of the need to strengthen individual connectedness. It's instead an indicator of poor household conditions, um, structural conditions that have worsened during the pandemic and which pre prevent kids from participating in school. So for them, school dropout isn't a motivation problem. It's not an individual problem. It's a systemic issue. It points to the impossibility of stimulating motivation in contexts where kids are hungry or where kids have to work. So to resolve this issue, an emphasis on in-school connection is prioritized since schools are seen as safe spaces which enable at least a temporary escape from uh, these other contexts. So as it was with NM, the public discourse around the issue of school dropout has continued to be addressed through these familiar arguments and solutions. There are those who, who are pro EAD, EAD and pro remote learning defend individual autonomy and advocate for motivation as a driver of success and for technology as a crucial means of problem solving. Those who are skeptical stand in opposition they have a system-wide understanding of education that sees education inequality not based on individual shortcomings, but on systemic conditions like hunger and poverty. Neither side of this debate, notably, has addressed how these broad issues like access, abandonment, and inequality have changed in the context of COVID-19. And very few that I've seen actually propose, sol so propose solutions that are specific to this context. The next crucial issue that comes into play in the debates around distance education in the pandemic revolves around the privatization of education. So for, the Brazilian, for the Brazilian government, uh, education at a distance uh, seems to be part of a broader agenda to privatize public school networks. This is an initiative which has been increased by the need for social isolation and distance learning um, and represents an investment uh, into bridging the gap between public and private schools. So this is evidenced by a lot of the recent policies that the Brazilian government has put into place to extend the use of EAD and remote learning um, during and post COVID um, and their efforts to digitalize and privatize more and more um, in public education. I could point, to, um, point you to specific examples of that. For remote learning skeptics, however, concerns about privatization abound, um, particularly concerning EAD. There was an article published in um, Diario Causa Operaria where the writer refers to EAD as a direct attack on students and schools and as, as evidence of the precariousness of public services. According to, to this article, EAD fits like a glove uh, into processes of precariousness, just as it fits into the final objection of these processes, which is the total quote, to total privatization of teaching. And it's true that throughout the pandemic, companies have been making huge investments in EAD, companies including Itaú Itaú Social, uh, Lemon, Laureate, others. And there is a monopoly of public-private digital EAD partnerships or actually 75% of online EAD services utilized in Brazil are offered by Google. So there is you know, um, 
reason for some concern. Yet for organizations, organizations and political actors like um, the PT, PSOL, Luta pelo Socialismo, a number of others that I've identified, uh, online EAD has been being applied, has been applied by the government during COVID in an opportunistic way, they say in a way that accelerates the implementation of privatized and exclusive public education plans. So essentially they say what is a crisis for some is good business for others. Privatization via digital EAD is also seen as some by a means of influencing school content. So it's a quote, strategy for the flow of the national common curricular base and its ideologies. This, this argument um, tends to revolve around concerns that tech-driven education will mean more standardized content, which will come at the expense of certain disciplines like the humanities and the social sciences. So the privatization of education via education at a distance is seen by EAD skeptics as not only a means of controlling capital flows, but also of controlling content. All right, the communication landscape around privatization is also character characterized by this um, one, additional in, um, one additional area, which I wanna just touch on really quickly which is um, what I've seen referred to time and time again as surveillance capitalism. So surveillance capitalism is essentially a critique that highlights concerns about young people's data and that the ways and the ways they're being put into commercial use. This precedes the pandemic, but has become more visible with the uptake of emergency EAD. So for example, uh, surveillance capitalism is the foremost concern of uh, Educación Vigiada, or guarded education, which is an initiative that was launched by a variety of academics and social organizations that opposes the logic of advancing business interests through the collection of personal data. Their concerns are founded on research that shows that the majority of public universities and state secretaries are exposed to surveillance capitalism on a consistent basis, um, that these organs become tools for enhancing business models that are based on data extraction. So Educação Vigiada and other groups call attention in particular to the lack of regulation of part partnerships between public education organs on the one hand and commercial organizations on the other, since these partnerships often don't involve any money spent on behalf of the educational organ um, since value is extracted via users' metadata. This is one sort of concern that I saw time and time again, um, and that, and I'm currently writing another article uh, report right now about education technologies, uh, where this surveillance capitalism and data extraction is also really central. So I thought I, I couldn't give a overview of the dis discourse landscape in Brazilian education without saying something about it. For some, political entities and some education institutes, digital EAD is the technology of the future for Brazilian education. Uh, Bolsonaro in particular has been pushing for more remote learning since his 2018 campaign. He's actually quoted saying that with teaching at a distance, you can help fight Marxism and that you can help make teaching in Brazil cheaper. So for him, face-to-face -face teaching shouldn't necessarily be the default modality for education in Brazil after the pandemic. Instead, it should be for special circumstances for testing or in what he calls practical classes. The president has also referred to EAD and distance education as part of his and the political rights initiative Escola Sem Partido, which essentially attempts to separate school content from political issues within the classroom. And since EAD is often advanced through more standardized platforms, it is seen um, by a number of proponents as posing less of a risk of indoctrination 
So if we take this perspective, the perspective of a good part of the Brazilian government, of Bolsonaro and his allies, the future of education at a distance looks really promising in Brazil. Uh, this is especially the case when you consider some of the policies that the government has rolled out, pro-education at a distance policies during the pandemic. Um, the main one among them being M the MP934, which essentially rescinds students' obligation to complete 200 days in school, but maintains the requirement for them to complete 800 hours of study. So it opens up space for EAD to become the new go-to teaching modality during and potentially after the pandemic. But of course, this MP934 and other actions the government's taken to expand EAD have not been unilaterally accepted. They've sparked a lot of outrage, especially among um, political organizations on the left and among student organizations who uh, decry the overuse, overuse of digital EAD and complain of patchy programs of these programs being authoritatively implemented and of others and of many students who can't keep up being excluded from the semester. Uh, another concern is that EAD can function as a tool that will be used to decrease teachers' salaries because it renders them less important potentially and to prompt the dismissal of key teaching and administrative staff. So the National Students Union is one example of a, an organization that's super critical of EAD um, during the pandemic that, that sees face-to-face -face schooling as a human right, um, that sees it as a place that secures students' rights to food and safety. Um, and the National Students Union has done something a little bit different than other actors within this discourse analysis have done um, in that they've urged politicians and educators to rethink the relationship between technology and education and to consider how to use digital EAD less for peer transmission and more for collective learning. So this is a, a bit of a, they're advancing a bit of a subtler discussion about how to leverage technology in specific ways. Um, and this subtle discussion is largely absent from the larger public discourse. On, on Brazilian education, which is constituted, as I've said, by political actors whose ideological standpoints render them either optimists or pessimists when it comes to EAD, who either celebrate or denounce this technology and who don't ask how we can use digital and non-digital tech both within and outside the classroom or how these practices have can or should change in lieu of COVID. Finally, I wanna say a word about teachers and parents because they're really the missing links from this discourse analysis. Um, like I said, I, I did a broad and deep sweep of the traditional media, social media, websites, political organizations, and teachers and parents just don't come up where you would expect them to, considering that they're crucial points of connection between students and schools. They're, they're quite absent from this broader political discourse um, that tends to be fixated on EAD. There are, however, several studies that have pointed to the importance of teachers during the pandemic and parents during the pandemic. They show that teachers and parents have unique sets of concerns related to these, these broader questions of access, inequality, dropout, so on and so forth. Uh, there was a study by the World Bank, for example, that addressed the role of teachers during the pandemic and demonstrated first uh, that their skills and experiences in using distance learning technology are critical factors that affect students' ability to learn and also pointed to the necessity of training in the use of such technologies, given that, that teachers' mastery of them are so important now. This subject, however, of, of training has also been largely absent from the mainstream discussion of education in COVID-19 Brazil. 
Um, one other study I wanted to mention is a study by the Peninsula Institute, which conducted a survey with 8,000 Brazilian teachers and found that they were really stressed. Uh, essentially, teachers worried about three things. They worried about their students, their students' conditions, especially for their more disadvantaged students. They worried about their, the new time and energy demands placed on them to, in preparing remote classes and in doing so without extra pay. And above all else, they felt really uncertain about how to use these new technologies. 83% feel totally untrained. 55% say they've had no support um, to teach using these new digital technologies. 55% uh, have no support to teach at a distance. And 75% would really like these resources, but they don't have them. So this problem of training doesn't come up in the broader discourse related to education, but after the Peninsula study was published, the National Council of Education Secretaries did begin offering some socio-emotional support for educators, but there's still a lack of debate around the issue of teacher stress. Uh, and there's really no concrete care policy that is in place to aid in their support during these times. So one last point just to work what's worth touching on is the problem of what um, the, the media has been referring to, has referred to where I found it as parent and teacher burnout. There are several news articles that have touched on this and they tell the stories of individuals who have to manage their day jobs and childcare while also participating in their kids' education, which obviously many parents are doing now in the midst of COVID and lockdown, quarantine and so on. Um, these perspectives are really essential, I think. They should, they should be included in education discourse and debates. And it's surprising that, that given the importance of these of teachers and parents as, as points of connection, that they've received so little attention during the pandemic. So just in conclusion, I've placed a few quotes up here, which um, I can pass my PowerPoint to all of you and you could read if you, if you would like to. Um, but it just suffices to say that all of them point to the need to rethink education and school in the midst of the current crisis. They point to the need to engage in subtler discussions, not only about whether distance learning is good or bad, but about how we can leverage it to meet new needs and address new concerns that have emerged within the pandemic context. Even so, the landscape, communication landscape of Brazilian education has not dived into these possibilities. It's far more focused. Far more it's been far more focused on drawing out long held debates, long approaches to education as depending on the one hand, individual solutions reliant on technological optimism, or on the other hand, structural system wide changes and critiques of policies enacted by the Temer and Bolsonaro governments. The efforts that do exist to rebuild education have been largely technological or technical. They've been focused more on establishing health protocols and, and guidelines for the, the return to classes and have focused less on something that would be specific to this COVID moment, like building hybrid pedagogical models that could be well suited to it. So these, the steps that are being made, I think, in education during COVID are steps in the right direction, but sometimes ignore the broader infrastructural problems that communities face, which prevent them from accessing remote education material or from sending their kids to school, and don't really regard the kind of banal day-to-day -day challenges that teachers and parents now face when attempting to teach and work from home. So in conclusion, with education discourse fixated um, along familiar political lines, it remains to be seen how the Brazilian government and how the public will restructure education and respond to the needs of those during and after COVID. Uh, the situation calls for more research and increased attention about the possibilities of breaching political divides to reconstruct education during COVID and should be particularly attentive to the anxieties and needs of parents, teachers, and students. 
should focus on ways that technology use can be remodeled for the present conjuncture, where Brazilian education is now situated within and conditioned by a political, economic, and health system in crisis. All right, that's all I have.